Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101 Live. Someone was asking me, how do you put out so much content? You, every day you've put out content. Actually, I think this is only the third episode I've done since the debate back in March 7th. And prior to that, I didn't do any except for the, uh, the, the, the pre-debate show. Um, and that's because of our good friend, Caleb, who does so much work going back in, in the archives, finding those two hour long videos, four hour long videos, whatever it is, and finding clips of 15 minute clips, you know, here and there that he'll rebroadcast like the one that was put out yesterday was a rebroadcast from another episode, which you sometimes can tell from my background as being different or my weight is up or down based upon what time of year it is. Um, and so different things. And today I have hat, hat head, you know, I was wearing a hat when I was walking this morning to get my exercise in and I. And that's why I was delaying. I was like, I can't get rid of this hat head. This marks on my head from wearing a hat. Anyway, all, all fun stuff with live broadcasting. And so um, I wanted to jump on and respond to the rogue Calvinist. Uh, usually I, I haven't taken time to respond to him because he's not a very charitable fella. Um, and I and I tend not to reward try, or try to reward or stage those who don't, put, one, put their name out there. I, I don't like when people use fake names. I, I don't like it when they're very uncharitable. But this this was a particularly... Good episode for us to respond to because I think it really highlights some major points. Uh, the accusation and misrepresentation is uh, abounds in these in these uh, th these discussions, and um, and I, I just want to say that I think if you put our broadcast up next to any of the major Calvinistic YouTubers out there, um, and and compare their representation of provisionism or Arminianism compared to my representation of Calvinists. Um, I think we will fare uh, a, a much higher on the grade scale than they will. In other words, I think we would get uh, an A minus, maybe a B plus, something like that in our representation of Calvinist. I strive to do as good as I can, whereas most of them wouldn't get above a C or a D plus. Um, and and that I, I, I think that could be proven demonstrably and shown. Um, even with this particular Calvinist's uh, episodes of his rep misrepresentation, of us and how he represents us. I mean, even in the show notes below the video that I'm going to be playing, it's like one misrepresentation after another, after another, after another. And some of that I'm going to just show you and, and hopefully demonstrate to you how this is kind of, you know, how it shows itself and how it's working. Um, before we jump into this, I do want to say a few things. One, thank you for our patrons and our subscribers. Those who have liked this video, have subscribed to the program, have put the little bell on there so you know when we jump on live. Um, that really does help us, so please do that if you haven't already. Uh, if you'd like to support us, uh, make a one-time donation or become a monthly patron, link is in the show notes. Also, if you're looking for a higher theological education, consider go to, going to Trinity Seminary. Um, that's where I am a professor of theology. Yes, I do that now full time. And so I would love for you to come and be a part of Trinity Seminary. You can learn more about that there at Sociology 101 or in the show notes, go to trinitysim.edu. Before we jump in, I do want to remind you my new book is out, Drawn by Jesus. It is a, um, uh, it's not just a, a biblical defense of God's provision for all. It's also a rebuttal of James White's book, Drawn by the Father. And so I put up next to James White's arguments for um, his his view of what drawing is entailing there in the book of John versus mine. And I walk through all of those arguments point by point for those that, those that want to go deeper. It's also on Audible. And so you can listen to this as you walk as well. I love Audible stuff because I love to be able to listen while I walk. And uh, it makes my walks not seem near as difficult when you're walking uphill and you're thinking about theology. You're not thinking about the pain you're feeling of doing the walking. Also, the, the Potter's Promise is always out. It's still my best seller. Um, I, I'm always amazed at how many units sell every month because people are still looking for good answers to the questions that Calvinists often bring. And this is is kind of the primer uh, and the one, the go-to, first go-to, kind of my in uh, coming into Calvinism, back out of Calvinism, uh, verse by verse through Romans 9. It touches on Ephesians 1, John 6, and some of the majors. And so I really appreciate that. I also got this cool gift from a... Um, a, a listener, uh, Janelle, thank you for this. Uh, she she apparently uh, rebounds books, and she put this in a hardcover, uh, The Potter's Promise, in a hardcover. And I thought that was such a cool gift, something I could pass down to my kids one day, and it's a, a nice hardcover, so it'll last uh, forever. Well, not forever, forever, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and so thank you, Janelle, for that. That was very sweet of you to do that. Thank you. It's a prized gift I will hold on to. 
And then, of course, the uh, God's provision for all doesn't even mention Calvinism, uh, but it is really defense of God's provision for all, and it is uh, very much just a, a kind of a positive presentation of why we believe God is demonstrably good. He's recognizably good, and the, the qualities of God are, are truly good. We don't just say that because we have to or because we're scared of him, uh, like he's going to smite us if we don't say that he's good, but he's recognizably good. His character is good, he, and, and good people provide for those in need. And that's what we believe God does. God provides for all who are in need. And uh, he doesn't just provide for some, he, he provides for all. Not because all are deserving or because he owes it to all people. He does it because his character, he's good. And that's that's the argument from that perspective. And so <clears throat> that, that I hope is uh, helpful to all of you. Um, I'm now looking at the side chat. And uh, <laughs> so did, did God decree Leighton to misrepresent R.C. Sproul? If God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, and I uh, did uh, did misrepresent R.C. Sproul, then yes, that would be the case that God decreed for me to misrepresent R.C. Sproul. And that, again, is something that the Calvinist has to deal with, if at least they're, if they're being consistent. All right, so, um, oh, he said, Rogue had a long conversation with living Christian. I did not know that. Um, maybe I need to go watch that before I even do this. I don't know. Maybe I should. Uh, end of regulation. Thank you for your, for your super chat. Uh, you're such a blessing to me. I didn't know what Calvinism was before last year. Your channel is so important. I listen while I work and I love your long episodes. I get a lot of that. You know, whenever we start putting out the short episodes, I get complainers from, I get complaints from our theology geeks. We like the long ones. Do the long ones. And because Caleb does do such a good job uh, creating our shorts, I have the liberty to do the long ones when I, when I so choose. And so, yes, we will be doing some of the long ones as well. Um, and Idol Killer is in the chat. Uh, welcome, Warren. And uh, many of you are here. I, I see uh, uh, Aaron saying hi, Elaine. Thank you. Caleb is in the house. Uh, so uh, thank you all for tuning in. And I, I appreciate, again, the support. So let's let's watch uh, this video from Rogue Calvinist. And let's just judge and be let's be objective. Uh, I know one thing about my listeners is they are not just um, blind followers that just go along to get along. Uh, Idol Killer is a good example of that. He and I disagree about stuff all the time about different things, and we'll push each other on this thought. Or, hey, what about this? Or, have you thought about this? I, I, don't, I don't really like uh, just people who blindly follow or just say, hey, I agree with something. We, we, we talk about surrendering our sense-making. Uh, the, at least the provisionists that I'm aware of uh, are not the kind of people who just uh, believe it because I say it. Um, in fact, I know that's not the case because I hear from you often about things you don't believe that I'm saying. And, and I like that you're good Bereans that check things out, that you question me on things. You certainly make fun of me when I mispronounce words and that never happens, of course. Uh, and so I, I like that the, that I, I have people who are willing to call me out when I do things wrong. That's one of the reasons I don't close the comments in my, uh, uh, you know, on YouTube, I listen and I read occasionally the comments. I can't read them all by goodness sake. It would take, that'd be a lifetime. Um, but I, I do uh, look at some of the comments and some of the pushback that I get, and it helps me to go deeper. And so I appreciate the pushback. Steve, uh, thank you for your super chat. I pray your ministry continues to help others as it did me. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that very much. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, let, let, let's jump into this video. We can go on forever talking to each other. Let's Let's watch this together and see what we learn. One of the main things that inspired me to start this channel was the open dishonesty of the critics of Calvinism. One of our leading critics, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Okay, so one, it automatically, the nefarious, you, you just assume, this is one of the reasons I really hesitated to even do this broadcast because I don't like promoting and platforming people who just assume that because somebody disagrees with you, they're nefarious, they're sneaky snakes, um, they're, they're dishonest, they're liars. Uh, the red eyes in my my picture. I mean, this is just real low level argumentation, um, and and doesn't deserve really a rebuttal. And 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 so that's one of the reasons I probably won't continue to engage with this man uh, unless he begins to change kind of his his approach to these kinds of things because this is not good Christian behavior. Um, unfortunately, this is what we're starting to see more and more on social media is more of this kind of representation, and. And yeah, it's a, the, the Caleb is like, Caleb makes our thumbnails, by the way. And, and he, he's making the observation that I noticed as well. He says, he made your eyes red, but whitened your teeth. <laughs> Interesting choice. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to go, if you're going to go ahead and make my eyes red, you might as well make my teeth yellow or something. I mean, 
my teeth are always, that's like good, man. I need to get some teeth white. <laughs> that's just so funny. That's a funny observation. Yes. Good. And so just things like that, it's just not necessary. I mean, if, if, if you have a good argument against somebody, you don't need to go to these kinds of extremes. It just weakens your case, Ro Calvinist, whoever you are. It weakens your case when you, when you use this kind of rhetoric and when you use this kind of advertisement. And now maybe some really people, people really get in, into that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, so, well, um, Idol Killer says he invited Ro Calvinist on to discuss things on his channel he, because he launched six plus videos attacking uh, Idol Killer apparently, and he says the invitation has been rescinded. In other words, I, I guess it's uh, not not something that's being held open for him anymore. Um, I, again, he didn't even notice that my eyes were red. Yeah, yeah, they're very very red there. Uh, okay, let, let's go on to see what what he has to say. Makes a habit of intentionally misrepresenting R.C. Sproul because. Okay, so again, intentionally misrepresenting R.C. Sproul. So it's my intention. I am. It's the nefarious. Layton's trying to misrepresent R.C. Sproul. Okay. Um, again, you're just assuming that because somebody disagrees with R.C. Sproul, they must be trying to misrepresent them. And is that is that evidenced by the things I have actually said or done about R.C. Sproul and for R.C. Sproul? Let's see. He can no longer defend himself. By the way, my first critiques of R.C. Sproul were long back when he was still living. Uh, people today still uh, critique John Calvin, who's no longer living. They critique Adrian Rogers, who's no longer living. I've seen people critique uh, a lot of old dead theologians and their views. As long as you're not attacking them personally, there's nothing wrong with uh, confronting the views of published authors who have gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, I have I've never been disrespectful to R.C. Sproul, as far as I know, um, and, and I've always uh, uh, attacked, if anything, attacked, uh, challenged, critiqued, his views, not the man personally. I, in fact, I've actually said a lot of nice things about R.C. Sproul over the years and my respect for him. I grew up, I cut my teeth on theology with R.C. Sproul. I've talked about the Lingonier ministry tapes that I received from R.C. Sproul and how much I learned from R.C. Sproul that I, I actually highly value much of what R.C. Sproul taught me over the years. I uh, obviously disagree with him now. This most recent example happened only three days ago. But notice what R.C. Sproul is saying here. He's saying if some of humanity is elect, then others are not elect. So the doctrine of election also goes side by side with the doctrine of reprobation. Notice what he says. The non-elect are those who we call the reprobate. So as far as I'm concerned, again, R.C. Sproul teaching, he says we are, univer we are universalists. There are no way to avoid the idea of double aspects. Unless you're a universalist, you, you have to have double predestination. You have to have election and reprobation. And of course, predestination is double. There is election and reprobation. We cannot avoid the fact uh, with any kind of textual gymna gymnastic or mental gymnastics is what he calls it. However, once we affirm double predestination, we have to ask what kind of double predestination we affirm. And then that's when he gets into the back and forth. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, let's take a closer look at where he stopped reading. As you can see, R.C. Sproul was just about to explain the difference between Reformed theology and hyper-Calvinism. But he knows that if he allows that, then he will no longer be able to present hyper-Calvinism as Reformed theology. Let's let R.C. Sproul explain the difference. Often, uh, double predestination is expressed. Okay, and the video goes on just the completion of R.C. Sproul's uh, explanation of double predestination. Okay, a couple things. One, every video that I produce is not attempting to cover every single point that R.C. Sproul or any other Calvinist brings up. I was specifically talking about a particular point in that video that he plays. The fact that I didn't continue to go on to read about where R.C. Sproul does differentiate between hyper-Calvinism and the asymmetrical views of equal ultimacy and all those kinds of things, because that wasn't the topic of that discussion, that video. Does that therefore mean I never discuss those things or I never allow R.C. Sproul to represent himself or that something I said in that actual video contradicted what R.C. Sproul goes on to say. Now, notice Ro Calvinist doesn't show anything that I actually said that contradicts what R.C. Sproul goes on to say. He insinuated just that I'm not willing to let R.C. Sproul speak for himself. I'm not willing to read through the rest of that article to really allow for R.C. Sproul to teach. Well, is that true? Well, Again, you can demonstrate something. You can show something is demonstrably false. So, Roe Calvinist, I'm about to show how you're demonstrably false. 
you you are you are the one doing the misrepresenting in other words uh for instance look with me if you will to my own and i have a different shirt on there so <laughs> notice i had the sh same shirt and some people wonder you know, why do you have the same shirt on videos well when i come to my studio there are certain shirts that i wear that don't look good on camera and so sometimes i'll take it off and put on a shirt that's hanging here in my studio that I know looks okay on the camera. And so sometimes it's the same two or three shirts that I have hanging here in my studio. So that's that's the reason for that, by the way, if <laughs> wanting to know. Okay, this is from October of 2021, two years ago, okay? Two years ago, and I, and I haven't altered anything. It's right there on video. You can still go find it. Uh, it Like I said, it's called R.C. Sproul on Predestination in Romans 9, okay? From October 9th, 2021. Everybody can see that on the screen? Okay, now listen to what I said then. Like. Piper does and others that we talked about in the last episode. Um, so mo moving on here, he says, there is election and reprobation, he writes. We cannot avoid the fact with mental gymnastics. And again, there are many quasi-Calvinists who are trying to avoid reprobation because uh, it, it they don't like it or they don't want to have to deal with it. They want to claim the good parts of Calvinism without accepting uh, the negative and a lot of them will do a lot of mental gymnastics to get which if you remember by the way there was some lutherans and we were talking about mark driscoll who were denying double predestination they were trying to call for single predestination we were showing where rc sproul actually defends double predestination but do we stop there listen to get there however he writes once we affirm double predestination we have to ask what kind of double predestination we affirm even within the communion of Reformed theology, there's an ongoing debate about that very question. Most agree that predestination is double. The, they deba the debate is over how to understand the double aspect. Pause. Notice that there's disagreement even among Reformed theologians. Okay, This is one of the reasons that sometimes you'll be accused of not understanding Calvinism because you're not representing their form of Calvinism. Just like I mentioned earlier, there are different kinds of Arminians. I'm sure there are different kinds of even provisionists, okay? And so sometimes you it seems like you might be misrepresenting Calvinism when it, when the truth is you're misrepresenting their specific kind of Calvinism. And some, and some people are, are more educated than others to recognize there are different aspects of uh, Reformed theology even among the Reformed. And so I just want to point that out. He continues, one view sometimes called hyper-Calvinism teaches a symmetrical 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 view of predestination or equal ultimacy a symmetrical view of double predestination holds that in the case of the elect god decreed their election from eternity and in the fullness of time intervenes in their lives and creates saving faith in their hearts by his grace god invades the soul of the elect and quickens them from spiritual death to spiritual life and brings them to faith in christ in a symmetrical manner the reprobate are doomed from eternity, and God in fullness of time intrudes into their lives and creates fresh evil in their souls, ensuring their ultimate reprobation and damnation. This symmetrical view believes that God, God works grace by direct intrusion, and he works hardening by creating evil in the reprobate in an equal manner. However, this is not the orthodox reform doctrine of pred double predestination, and I do not hold to that symmetrical view or equal ultimacy. Now, stop there for a second, okay? So he's condemning this concept of equal ultimacy because God is not, quote-unquote, working evil into the hearts of people in the same way that he's supposedly working good in the hearts of the elect. But what is he doing instead? He's just letting them do what they, quote-unquote, do naturally, is what he's going to go on to argue. But what does that mean on a worldview where all things are sovereignly and unchangeably decreed by God before the creation of the world? Do, do you understand the point? In other words, what is to say, well, they're doing what they're doing naturally. God is not working it in them to do it. What, is it, what do they mean when they say he, he's doing it naturally? We don't, we don't believe in Mother Nature here. I mean, Calvinists don't believe that there's that, that man's nature is somehow independent of the sovereign decree of God. In other words, it, this this seems to be a, a distinction without a difference to me. At least I, I, I don't see any real distinction with a difference between what he just argued as equal ultimacy and what he's going to argue for 
as the orthodox position of Reformed theology, which he writes, quote on, quote, quoting on, he, he says, I hold to positive negative view of double predestination. A positive negative distinction in predestination is this. In the case of the elect, God positively intervenes in their lives to rescue them from their corrupt condition. Pause. This would be irresistible grace on the eye on tulip, right? So God is positively intervening with irresistible grace, the effectual calling, regeneration, whatever you want to call it, right? He's intervening to change their hearts, to give them new birth, right? He's intervening to do what? To train, change their corrupt condition. Now, pause. How did their condition become corrupt in the first place? If not by sovereign decree. Who, if not God, sovereignly decreed that because Adam fell, everybody would be born in a condition where it was corrupt and they would only reject the things of God. And how is that not active? How is that not just as active as what he's doing for the elect? You tell me, I don't, I don't, I do not see how Calvinists think they're getting around this quandary by calling for a positive negative view of double predestination versus a positive positive view. Okay, and so you can go watch that video to get more on that, but I go on to read through the rest of this. Matter of fact, there's a three-part series, all of them over two hours long, I think, going through this book by R.C. Sproul, point by point. And yes, it's in this series, I can't tell you exactly where someone was asking, that I talk about how uh, he has to hold to a foresight sin view. He doesn't call it a foresight sin view. I'm using his own vernacular because you have foresight faith view, which we'll get into in just a minute. Um, from from what the Calvinist does to to kind of caricature the Arminian view that God foresees the the faith and therefore elects them. Well, you have to have God foreseeing or taking into account the sin in order to reprobate them. And this gets into conditional reprobation. In other words, R.C. Sproul argues for conditional reprobation, whereas actually J.I. Uh, John Piper argues for unconditional reprobation or unconditional hardening is, is what he talks about, which we'll get, to get into in this episode as well. And so th this is one of the reasons I wanted to use Rogue Calvinist's video to introduce this topic, because this is a kind of a hot button topic among even the Calvinists, because there's differing ways in which Calvinists deal with God's active positive work in reprobating or in hardening people and what that looks like because different Calvinists take different approaches for different reasons. And some of those things highlight the inconsistency of Calvinism. And as we have learned from Dr. White rightly, uh, the inconsistency is the sign of a failed argument. So Calvinists fail, I believe, because they are very inconsistent or the, it, it, their inconsistency demonstrates their failure in dealing with these issues because they are not consistent on how they deal with the doctrine of predestination and its opposite reprobation and how those two go together. Um, and so just, just to kind of put a, a an end to or a nail in the coffin of a uh, of rogue Calvinist accusation of misrepresentation, notice the video that he showed. If I, uh, I can show you from April of 2021, yeah, April 9th of 2021, again, two years ago. Uh, let's just see what this video is about. Tennessee, let's watch this. Is, what is double predestination? Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about double predestination. There are some communities that believe in what they call... Anybody recognize that video? It's the same video that the rogue Calvinist showed as if I would not be willing to listen to R.C. Sproul's explanation of double predestination. And I go on, play the entire video, and then I respond to R.C. Sproul's actual words. And so once again, rogue Calvinist has been demonstrated to be wrong in his accusation of me misrepresenting Calvinist because he never showed anything that I actually said that misrepresented what R.C. Uh, Sproul or any other Calvinist went on to say. And so we've got to do better at not just assuming that your opponent is a red eye serpent with really white teeth trying to deceive everybody and trying to misrepresent everybody they disagree with. Instead, actually quote them in their own words and then make an argument based upon what they actually say. That's good uh, apologetic and good ways of interacting with people you might disagree with. And so uh, if nothing else, rogue Calvinist gives us an example of what not to do when it comes to confronting those who disagree with us. All right. So this is where I want to go back to, let me go back to um, the, uh, I think the probably the best thing to kind of cover here 
is is to look at at um, R.C. Sproul's representation of us. So we we talk about rogue Calvinists misrepresenting provisionist or Arminians. Uh, and I'm putting ourselves in the same general camp because we're non-Calvinist. Okay. So I would just say non-Calvinist, the way in which rogue Calvinist represents non-Calvinist, the way in which R.C. Sproul represents non-Calvinist. So it's one thing to talk about some rogue Calvinist on YouTube who has no name or credentials that we're aware of at least. And what about R.C. Sproul's representation of us non-Calvinist? Well, here's from that same book. In fact, just a few pages before, um, where he says, although the doctrine set forth in Romans 9 is absolutely clear, it's so clear that, you know, there's been controversy over it uh, since the beginning of time, uh, but never, nevertheless, this is the way sometimes Calvinists have it presented. It, it, Romans 9 is absolutely clear. People have to use three basic ways to get around it. So how is R.C. Sproul representing us? He's representing these people are trying to get around the obvious clear teaching of Romans 9. Is basically the way he's poisoning the well, so to speak, to push into this. And so this is one of the best of the best. R.C. Sproul's one of the good ones. He's an infralapsarian. He's a low Calvinist and very well known and very highly respected. And let yet look at how he represents his opponents and tell me, is it even as fair as Leighton Flowers is in representing Calvinist? Let's look. Look at the three ways that he suggests that people are trying to get around Romans 9, the clear teaching of Calvinism in Romans 9. One, the easiest and most common way of getting around the doctrine of election is to ignore it or avoid it. And I actually, when I first went through this, I actually acknowledge there are some non-Calvinists who do just that. They just ignore it. They just try to get around it. They just say, yeah, let's all get along. Yeah, you may be right, but also Ar Arminians are right too. They're mutually exclusive rightnesses. You know, when you talk about John 3, 16, we want to preach like an Arminian. And when we talk about Romans 9, we're going to preach like a Calvinist. And both of them are just true. Or they just ignore it altogether. That is one approach for non-Calvinists. I, I admit that is one way some of them try to, quote unquote, get around it. Two. Others say that Paul in Romans 9 is not writing about God's sovereign election of individuals, but about God's sovereign election of nations to a particular historic destiny, specific, specifically Israel as distinguished from Syria, Babylonia, Greece, Rome, or other nations of antiquity. The grace that the apostle is expounding on here, they argue, is not saving grace, but the promise of earthly benefits, such as the inheritance of a piece of real estate, which is very much contested, even with violence. Okay. This is what would be referred to as the corporate view of election that he's confronting here. But there are no advocates for the corporate view of election who would say anything like that as response to how we understand Romans 9. Go read Brian Abishano. He is the leading proponent of the corporate view of election alive today, has written the most about the corporate view of election regarding Romans 9 today. And there is not, there, there's, there is nothing Oma, I would say, I, if I were giving him a grade as a professor, and, and I am a professor who grades papers at times, if I were to give him a grade of representing what the corporate view of election is, I would give him an F. R.C. Sproul would get an F on this paper. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen Abishano and others confront R.C. Sproul's view. This is, this is a horrible representation of what Calvinist, uh, of what non-Calvinists who believe in the corporate view of election would say with regard to Romans 9. Um, we don't believe it's just election to nations to particular historic destinies. We talk about being uh, the election of a nation, um, especially as a provisionist in particular. We talk about, yes, the nation of Israel was elected for the, the noble purpose of bringing the Messiah and his message, the purpose of redemption, the law and the prophets, all of those things. Not just, not just a historical destiny um, as distinguished from Syria and Babylon, Greece and Rome. Of course not. There's salvific aspects of why Israel was elected, and we're not. We don't neglect negate the fact that there are uh, individuals within that nation who are selected. What are the prophets? Individuals. Uh, wh what are the what are the apostles? Individuals. They were chosen for the noble cause, the noble purpose of bringing the Messiah and His message. The gospel was proclaimed through chosen messengers from Israel. Those are individuals. Okay, so. This is just a very, and, and maybe you could say reductionistic, um, a very, a very uh, poor representation of the corporate view of election from one of the leading scholars, R.C. Sproul, here. The third is the doctrine of election is 
uh, also gotten around, and so there's an assumption that you're just trying to get around the doctrine of election. One, nobody's trying to get around the doctrine of election, okay? What, what he should say is the, the doctrine of Calvinistic election, okay? In, uh, in other words, and, and we're not just trying to get around it, we, we disagree with your Calvinistic uh, understanding of the doctrine of election. And he says, by a method we consider repeatedly during our study of Romans, God's foreknowledge. Supposedly, God looks down the quarters of time. Again, there's not any Arminians, known Arminians that I'm aware of that uses that kind of vernacular of God looking through the quarters of time like God is stuck on a time scale way back in time and he's peering through the future to see what happens and then making choices based upon what he foresees will happen. Okay, That is a character caricatured view that many Calvinists have just adopted today. Matter of fact, there may be even some Arminians who have adopted the caricature that the Calvinists have brought. I, I, I mean, I, I'm... When, when I do a search for the quarters of time, I see Calvinists saying this about the classical Arminian prescience view, okay? And knowing what in advance what people will do. That's not the way a Molinist would ex describe the, the God's view of time and how God works within time and space, for example. Um, in other words, the best the best scholars would not represent it this way. That's one of the reasons I use the quarter of time perspective when I talk about Esau before he's ever done anything bad is reprobated. Well, how do you how do you do that? Well, R.C. Sproul in this same book, which we went over in another broadcast, goes through how God knows in advance the fall and Esau's sin. In other words, he quote unquote looks through the quarters of time to see the fall and to see Esau's sin so as to reprobate him, because you can't have God reprobating the innocent on Calvinism or on R.C. Sproul's view of Calvinism, because he doesn't want to be considered a superlapsarian. A uh, high uh, Calvinist that would con that would have God condemning the innocent, and so he has to have God taking into account the fall by peering into the future to foresee it. Okay, that's that's the only way for him to do it. Again, he wouldn't say that God is peering into the future to foresee it, just like an Arminian wouldn't say that, just like a Molinist wouldn't say that. But again, if you're going to paint us that way we can use the same vernacular to paint you that way if you have to take into account the fall and the sin of Esau in order to reprobate him. And so uh, which which view actually is a misrepresentation of the other? You tell me. Look at, look, look at who's saying what about whom, who's using their actual quotes. Notice R.C. Sproul does not quote a single scholar to support what he's saying in any of these three quote-unquote how they get how the scholars get around Calvinistic election. He doesn't quote a single scholar. All three of my books, right here, I dare you to go find a section in any. Where, where's my third one? I, oh, there it is. It was underneath this other one. Go through all three of these books and find where I ever said Calvinists believe X, Y, Z, and I don't quote a Calvinist saying and supporting what I believe X, Y, Z is. I don't do that in my books because I know I'm going to be held to account by all you Calvinists who read through every single thing and say everything thing I say. And yet in his big book on Romans 9, he makes three accusations towards those who are quote, quote unquote disagreeing with his election view of Romans 9, and he doesn't cite a single one of them. Who's really doing the misrepresenting here, folks? I'm using their own words. I quote their sources whenever I bring rep misrepresentation. This is what we get from one of the best, R.C. Sproul. And he doesn't represent our view at all. Um, and, and so I'm holding us hopefully to a higher discord when it comes to these kinds of things. All right. There's a few things I want to go over. One, <clears throat> I want to make sure that I, I want you to see, we've pointed this out before, from John Calvin's own lips, what he describes as double predestination, the understanding of reprobation when it comes to the doctrine of election. Many professing a desire, he writes, to defend the deity from an infidious charge to admit the doctrine of election, but they deny any one is reprobated. This they do ignorantly and childishly, since there could be no election without its opposite reprobation. So sorry, Lutherans, um, he's calling you ignorant and childish. I mean, that's basically what he's doing. And and what he's doing, he's being logically consistent. I mean, if you're going to have, it, it's kind of like what monergism.com says um, right here. 
when it says, just as God chooses some for mercy and salvation, he chooses others for judicial hardening and reprobation. When he loved Jacob, even before his birth, he also hated Esau at the same time. Monergism.com is being consistent, okay? They're being Calvinist, consistent Calvinist. God loves Jacob before he did anything good. And he hates Esau before he did anything bad, okay? And and you can't, if you're going to be a consistent in your hermeneutic and say unconditional election must be true, then you have to have unconditional reprobation. I unconditionally love Esau. I mean, I unconditionally love Jacob. Therefore, I unconditionally hate Esau. Now, R.C. Sproul did not like that. He argued against it. He argued against the superlapsarian position in his book, which, again, I went over in three different broadcasts uh, going through that entire book. So I did represent exactly what R.C. Sproul says, and I showed how I thought it was inconsistent, and then I held it up next to other Calvinists, Super Lapsarian, A.W. Pink, John Piper kind of Calvinist, who disagreed with R.C. Sproul and, and showed how they disagree with each other. So who's misrepresenting Calvinism here? I'm, I'm representing both forms of Calvinism by showing one arguing against the other and why they disagree with each other. And then I'm also showing the namesake of the actual system, John Calvin himself, by calling those ignorant who try to get away from double predestination. He says, God is said, again, Calvin speaking, God is said to set apart those whom he adopts for salvation. It were most absurd to say that he admits others fortuitously or that he, by their industry, acquire what election alone confers on a few, confers on a few. Those, therefore, whom God passes by, he reprobates, and that for no other cause but because he is pleased to exclude them from the inheritance which he predestines to his children. So what other cause is there? Oh, because they sinned? Oh, well, because he foresees their sin, because he takes into account the fall? No, for no other cause but because he was pleased to exclude them. He was pleased to exclude Esau before he did anything bad. This is consistent Calvinism, okay? Not all Calvinists are consistent with John Calvin, though. Like R.C. Sproul, who argues that no, Jacob, uh, Esau, is actually reprobated conditionally on the fact that God takes into account his sin and the fall and all that comes with it, okay? In conformity, Calvin writing, therefore, to the clear doctrine of the scripture, we assert that by an eternal and immutable counsel, God has once for all determined whom he would admit to salvation and whom he would condemn to destruction. We affirm that this counsel, as far as concerns the elect, is founded on his gratuitous mercy, totally irrespective of human merit. Before he did anything good, totally irrespective of his faith, totally irrespective of any condition whatsoever. It is a unilateral decision. You could even call it, as, as Calvin did, or as Edwards did, an arbitrary decision prior to his creation to give him mercy, to save him. But that to those whom he devotes, continuing in the quote, but to those he devotes to con condemnation, the gate of life is closed by a just and irreprehensible but incomprehensible judgment. In the elect we consider calling as an evidence of election and justification as another token of its manifestation till they arrive in glory, which constitutes its completion. As God seals his elect by vocation and justification, so by excluding the reprobate from the knowledge of his name and the sanctification of his spirit, he affords an indication of the judgment that awaits them. Again, I ask, whence does it happen that Adam's fall irremediably involves so many peoples together with their infant? Uh, oh, he mentioned infants. Doggone it. He shouldn't have meant. He should have. He shouldn't have mentioned infants like that. That makes it all emotional. Now this argument can be thrown out. I should have skipped over that part so that this argument couldn't be ignored. Anyway, okay. Irremediably involves so many peoples together with their infant offspring, and eternal death, unless because it so pleased God. So what's the reason the infant offspring and all the reprobates go to hell? It so pleased God. Calvin doesn't try to say no. It's because of their sin. No, it's because of God's pleasure, God's will, God's arbitrary decision. Hear their tongues uh, otherwise, so loquaciously must become mute. The decree is dreadful. Indeed, I confess. This is what makes it such a dreadful decree that God chose before you were ever born, whether or not before taking into consideration the good and bad you do. And by the way, 
What does it matter, the good and the bad you do, not being taken into consideration if God is the one who determines your good and bad you end up doing? That's like saying God doesn't um, take into account what he has decreed for you to become in order to decide what it is that you're going to become. It, do, it just makes absolutely no rational sense when you plug determinism into Romans chapter 9 and try to understand it rationally. Um, and not, not when you back away and think about it. Okay, so this gets into the major issues that you'll hear between the super and infralapsarians, which R.C. Sproul goes over in his book, and I read from in that original broadcast that I, I just referred to. And I go through and show how R.C. Sproul, go read that again. I dare you to go read and listen to that again, because R.C. Sproul comes down hard on superlapsarians, um, calling what they're saying heresy. And and he's harder he's harder than on superlapsarians than Leighton Flowers is. <laughs> if you want to go listen to R.C. Sproul, remember when I read back through that, he, he really does rake over the coals real harshly superlapsarians, like John Piper is. Um, apparently, according to this particular um, uh, article that I'm about to read. Matter of fact, let me put this one in a bigger screen because I, I really want you to see this. Um, this is our Design God, which is uh, John Piper's ministry. And um, here, here is his, his teaching on unconditional hardening. Okay, And this really gets into um, some, some difficult stuff. And so we get into the weeds here, guys. We we look at both sides of the Calvinisms uh, of Calvinism's views with regard to hardening, and uh, reprobation, and equal ultimacy, and all those kinds of things. Um, and that that reminds me before we, before we jump here, I, I meant to do this earlier. Um, I, I meant to. I wrote this back in two two thousand eighteen. Okay, this is from two thousand eighteen where this is a blog article. And so this is another uh, re re rejection of what Road Calvinist was saying, like, I just don't represent uh, R.C. Spool correctly. Look what I do. I, I first quote from John Calvin, how foolish and frail is the support of divine justice supported by the suggestion that evils come to be not by God's will, but by his permission. It is quite frivolous su to suggest, uh, or a frivolous refuge to say that God otusely permits them when scripture shows him not only willing, but the author of them. And then he goes on to quote from Augustine, Supporting Augustine's view, saying, Who does not tremble at these judgments, with which God works in the hearts of even the wicked, whatever he will? Just let that let that sentence seek in, ladies and gentlemen. God works in the hearts of even the wicked, whatever he will, rewarding them nonetheless according to desert. In other words, God works in the hearts of wicked people, the wickedness that they do, and they still are judged for it. It's basically what that's saying. Isn't that what you're reading? Again, it is quite clear from the evidence of Scripture. Again, quoting from Calvin, who's quoting from Augustine. Um, again, it's quite clear in the evidence of Scripture that God works in the hearts of men to incline their wills just as he will, whether to good, for his mercy's sake, or to evil, according to their merits. Let, let me let let me just let that sink in for you, Calvinists who are watching on the side chat. Absolutely clear that he is saying God works in the hearts of men to incline their wills to evil according to their merits, and that's not equal ultimacy, because you'll notice that in this article, what I do is I go on to quote from. Al Mohler, John MacArthur, John Piper, about being the permitter of sin. Contrast the statements of Edwards, Piper, and MacArthur with the ones from Calvin above, and the inconsistency becomes quite clear. Calvinistic theologian R.C. Sproul addresses the heresy of equal ultimacy by giving this warning. And I go on and I read exactly from R.C. Sproul talking about the, the synergism of God not working in fresh evil and not doing that. It's a gross, inexcusable caricature. He says it's a gross, inexcusable caricature of the doctrine. Such a view may be identified with that as often loosely described as hyper-Calvinism. It involves a radical form of super-lapsarianism. This idea that God is the one working evil into the hearts of men, that is considered a gross heresy, but yet you have John Calvin quoting from Augustine, 
promoting that very view. So where are they calling John Calvin a, a heretic? Where, where, where is it? Where is it all the Calvinists are calling John Calvin a heretic for saying this and for quoting Augustine? Where are they, why aren't they calling Augustine? Who's the one who originally said that a heretic? How can you say this is such a gross, horrible, radical form of superlapsarianism while your namesake, both of your namesakes, Augustinian Calvinists, both of your namesakes are promoting this concept and idea that God works into them this evil. Is Calvin's first quote I write in support of equal ultimacy? If not, how? How? How are they different in any meaningful way? And what practical difference is there with the Calvinistic claims that described above as equal ultimacy? Can anyone clearly define a distinction with a difference between a world where God is said to hate one brother and love another before creation and the, in the of the world? described by Dr. Sproul under the label of equal ultimacy. Is God merely permitting or allowing anything according to Calvinism's teaching? For a Calvinist to affirm divine permission in any sense of the word is for them to affirm a contra-causal or autonomous creaturely free will. For what is there to permit in a deterministic worldview except God's own determination? In other words, if, if God is permitting an evil person to act evilly, it seems to suggest that the evil is not decreed by God. Otherwise, what is he permitting? His own decree? That again, this is where it, it begins to fall apart on itself. Is God restraining that which he determined? In other words, you'll hear uh, some Calvinists talk about God restraining evil. What's he restraining? His own decree? So he decrees them to want to kill somebody and then restrains them from doing what he decreed for them to want to do? How does that make any rational sense unless you allow for any uh, level of uh, autonomy or libertarian freedom? The only way you have God intervening to restrain something is if somebody's doing something independently of what God decreed them to do. This is how you have to ultimately come back and, and work through these things point by point and recognize the reason this inconsistency uh, exists I mean, among the Calvinists is because inconsistency is the sign of a failed argument. And determinism is a failed argument. Theistic determinism is fallen from the very beginning and the reason you have all of this quandary with the infralapsarian, sublapsarian, and all the other lapsarian controversies. Okay, back to Piper's sermon because he's going to illustrate for you very clearly the distinction between the lower forms of Calvinism and the higher forms of Calvinism. It's going to be really clear once we walk through this, okay? Watch it. Before we go back there, this is Piper, by the way, if you're not seeing the screen, this is from Desiring God, John Piper, his, his sermon. Okay. Before we go back there to see what Paul saw in Exodus, make sure we see what Paul says here. What does he mean in Romans 9.18 by the words, he hardens whom he wills? There are at least seven reasons for thinking, uh, seven reasons for thinking he meant God is free in hardening whom he hardens and does not base bases on his decision whom to harden on anything a person does. So what, what is Piper, follow what Piper's arguing here, guys. He's saying that hardening is unconditional. In other words, he's not choosing to reprobate or and or to harden anybody based upon their sinfulness or their corruption. He's basing it unconditionally. Just like he chooses to elect somebody unconditionally for salvation, he chooses to harden and reprobate somebody unconditionally, not based upon anything that that person does. Okay? Are you following that? That's Piper's argument here. Before I show you the seven reasons, let's be sure you know what I'm saying and what he is saying. When I say that he hardens whom he wills, I mean he decides who will rebel in their hardness of unbelief and therefore deservingly be condemned. Now, he'll even admit in other parts that the deservingly part is a mystery. A mystery okay? We don't know why they're deserving, just like John Calvin says. He's meditated on these things so long, he's not afraid to confess ignorance. He doesn't know why men deserve to be condemned, and God doesn't. But it's just a mystery. You have to accept it. It's just true. Yes, God's the one who determines his hardness and unbelief from birth. They never could help it. But still, somehow, he deserves to be condemned. Okay, That's basically the, the crux of the entire Calvinistic system when you really break it down. The hardening of God does not make fault impossible. It makes fault certain. So what's he saying? It makes your fall, your sin, certain. Okay? And in other words, it's the causal. It, the, the word makes there could be causal. The causal decree. He decrees for you to be an unbeliever. He makes it certain, your fault. Now here's the mystery. So notice he's appealing to mystery here. Here's the mystery. 
which is why the opinions of man don't count for much. People who are hardened against God are really guilty. And this is why he, this is what I was saying earlier. They're guilty, but we don't know why they're guilty. Okay. On our view, it's pretty clear why someone's guilty. The same reason that a drunk who drives his car and kills a person is guilty is because the drunk had free choices before becoming a drunk. In other words, he became a drunk by his own free choices. Now you may say, well, he was under addiction to alcohol and he was under the influence of alcohol. So why would you hold him guilty? Well, because he had choices to get to that stage of drunkenness. Um, and, and, and the same with hardness. Um, you may say, well, how can uh, he help it? Because he's hardened and he's just who he is. Well, he, he had free choices to get to that place, place of hardness. His character wasn't born such as he was a hardened criminal so much so that he would do these evil blasphemous things. No, he became that because he closed his eyes and he chose not to listen to the things of God. And so he's guilty because he's become this way by free choice, not that he was born this way by divine decree and he couldn't help it. That's the differences between our views. And so that's why we would say they're really guilty because they're in that stage, in that condition because of choices, not because of a divine decree or a nature they were born by default into. Okay. All right. Moving on. Piper writing. They have real fault. They are really blameworthy. Now he never, notice he'll never say why they're really blameworthy. He just says they are and you have to accept it. Okay. Even though they don't seem blameworthy, they really are. And you just need to accept it. That's the mystery you need to accept if you're going to accept Calvinism. They really deserve to be judged. And God decided who would be in that condition. If you demand an explanation for how this can be, that God decides who is hardened and yet they have real guilt and real fault, there are, pointer, there are pointers in the Bible, but they will not satisfy the natural fallen human mind. In other words, what he's doing is he's preempting any of you to use your conscience or to use any rational thought and say, guys, you're not going to come up with a good answer for this. You're, you're going to run into a brick wall just like Piper did for three days when he cried weeping over this doctrine. You're not going to get any real good answers for why people are held guilty on Calvinism. But just believe me, it's true. Is basically what he's ultimately get, trying to get you to say. And we're here to say, nah, uh-uh. You're wrong, Piper. You have misinterpreted the Bible. Not only are you wrong, John Piper, you disagree with a large swath of the Reformed tradition, John Piper. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not coming at you, John Piper, alone. I'm coming at you with other Calvinists. Okay, and so I, I want you to hear this because Piper is arguably one of the most influential Calvinists in the world today. And R.C. Sproul, if you really put them side by side, in his book, contended with what John Piper is, is teaching here. And so does others, like Stott, as you're about to hear. Okay? Now, he goes on. I do not offer that explanation now. I simply assert that what I see in the world, God hardens whom he wills, and man is accountable. God's hardening does not take away guilt. It renders it certain. In other words, God is the cause of the guilt. That's, that's exactly what he's saying right here. He renders it certain that you're guilty. In other words, he is the one who's ultimately the causal, decisive cause of you being hardened, you being guilty, and all that goes with that. And thank you for the super chats. We'll get to those at the end of the program. Now, he goes on the seven contextual evidences for unconditional hardening. Now, what are the evidences in this text, Piper speaking, that the words, he hardens whomever he wills in Romans 9.18, mean that God freely and conditionally decides who will be hard and who will not. One, that's what the words most naturally mean. So his first argument is that's what the words most naturally mean. He hardens whomever he wills. Says that he will and not our will is a decisive in hardening. Now, obviously that seems to presume, again, just like John, uh, James White does in our debate, um, he assumes unconditionality. There's no condition for the hardening, just like there's no condition for the election. You can't assume that. You have to establish it, Piper. And you're just, you just seem to be assuming that there's just no reason God would harden Pharaoh. Well, look at his life. Look at how he lived his life. He's got really good reasons for hardening Pharaoh, just like he has really good reasons, reasons for hardening Judas. He, he knows Judas's heart. He, notices, he knows his, his character and his lifestyle and all the things he's done. He has a really good reason to harden Pharaoh those people. And to assume that he's doing so unconditionally or unilaterally because of a, some unilateral pleasure of his own will prior to existence is absolutely unfounded. And it absolutely undermines the goodness and the character of our God. And even some Calvinists agree with me on that point, namely R.C. Sproul. Okay. So to be sure, 
our will rebels. And but before I go on, R.C. Sproul is inconsistent on this too. Um, and I've shown that in other videos where I show where R.C. Sproul argues this in his book, but then in a video response to a question, he steps into more of a Piper view on some of these issues because you'll often notice Calvinists jumping in, jumping camps, depending on where they're speaking or who they're speaking to or what they're speaking about. Because again, inconsistency is the sign of a failed argument. And this is one of the most difficult and inconsistent doctrines within the whole Calvinistic uh, family in the, their worldview. It's this concept of un unconditional reprobation, unconditional hardening, as he is addressing here specifically in the sermon. Piper goes on, to be sure our will rebels and is hard against God, but the natural meaning of these words is that God, God's will is decisive. In other words, um, it's the, it's the, it's, it's causal. Okay. So God decides what you will decide. So he's not saying that men don't make decisions. You'll always hear that Calvinists believe men make choices, but you will make a choice based upon what God has decisively caused you to choose. So God chooses what you will choose, but you're still making real choices. And that's the mystery. That's where they're saying, God's the one who's deciding what you'll decide, but your decision is actually, culp you're culpable for your decision. Why? We don't know why it's just true. So accept it. Okay. That's basically what they're arguing. So beneath and behind our willing without nullifying the importance of our will. Two, the exact parallel with mercy shows that the act of God in hardening as unconditional as the act of God in having mercy. At least Piper is consistent with his Calvinism. At the same time that Jacob is loved, i.e. shown mercy, salvation, because remember they're reading it individualistically about effectual salvation. So in the same way that before he did anything good, Jacob is chosen for salvation, at the same time Esau is reprobated for damnation before he did anything bad, therefore unconditional reprobation. Got it? Verse 18, he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. So if we believe that God's showing mercy is unconditional, the most natural way to take the parallel is that the hardening is unconditional. Got it? By the way, it irks me to no end that I didn't get to this question in my debate with James White because it was next on my list. And I, I got so caught up in all the stuff that we were going back and forth and diverting of changing his views and, and nitpicking my questions and all kinds of things. I, I wanted to ask him about the hardening of this crowd because they were obviously hardened. They'd become ever seeing, never perceiving. They were in a hardened condition. Do you believe this hardening that, that, that John speaks of? Uh, the reason this crowd can't believe is because God has blinded their eyes. He's hardened their hearts. Do you believe that hardening is unconditional? Because I would have loved wh where he would have stood on this particular issue and, and hear his answer to that. Now, I suspect based upon how he ran from all the other questions that he would probably have some way of getting around at having to uh, deal with the, the difficulty of this question too. But uh, nevertheless, I'd love to have been able to ask it. Uh, point three, this is in fact exactly what Paul infers from God's word in verse 15. I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Paul draws out of this in verse 16. So then it depends not on the human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. If that is what I have mercy on whom I have mercy means, then it is probably what I, I will harden whom I harden means. Namely, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on the God who hardens. Point four. And I could say something more about every, once of the, every one of those, but I'm trying to get through this a little bit quicker. So uh, mo moving along, because I want you to hear some of the, the pushback from his view. The parallel with Jacob and Esau shows that the mercy and hardening are unconditional. Paul said in verse 11 and 13, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. In other words, the context demands that Paul address not just the love and mercy part of God's sovereignty, but also the hate and hardening part of God's sovereignty. The parallel with Jacob and Esau in verse 13 shows that the hardening and mercy are unconditional. Okay? So again, I'm, I'm showing you there is a consistent Calvinistic, high Calvinistic, superlapsarian kind of a view held by Piper that flies in the face of what we read from R.C. Sproul in another in the other episode. Um, just one second. I need to. <coughs> I didn't hit my cough button quite fast enough. Sorry. Um, I'm getting over, you may notice from my, the raspiness of my voice, I'm getting over a, 
a head cold and I, I cough. And so forgive me for having to do that every once in a while. And I'm sorry, I coughed in your ear there. I thought I'd hit that button fast enough. Um, the objection and Paul's answer to it in verse 19 shows that Paul did not deal with God's sovereignty the way most people deal with it today. Paul raises the objection, you will say to me, then why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? Now, at this point, most people say God finds fault because his hardening is a response to their, is a response to a prior self-hardening. That's what we say. In fact, it's not just what we say. It's what a lot of other Calvinists have said. Okay. So he's, he's, He's passively letting them go their own way and he's giving them over to their rebellion and he's hardening them in their already rebellious ways. Those kinds of things are even what some infralapsarian, lower R.C. Sproul type of Calvinist have argued. But Piper is standing against that. Follow this, okay? For example, one popular and usually good commentary, matter, matter of fact, he's quoting here from Leon Morris, who is a Calvinist, who is quoting uh, directly from John Stott, Okay. So this is, um, both of these are Calvinists. John Stott is a Calvinist. Leon Morris is a Calvinist, just so you know. Quote, neither here nor anywhere else is God said to harden anyone who had not first hardened himself. That Pharaoh hardened his heart against God and refused to humble himself is made plain in the story. So God's hardening of him was a judicial act, abandoning him to his own stubbornness. John Piper replies to that quote. By the way, that quote right there, I could have written it. Okay, That is consistent with my take. Matter of fact, I think I even cite that in my book on Romans 9 because I believe what John Stott says. I believe what Leon Morris says, that no one is hardened arbitrarily, that they are uh, given over, they're strengthened in their resolve. They're given over to their already rebellious will, which only makes sense in a world where there's something to give them over to that God hasn't decreed. And if God's decreed whatever comes to pass, then what is God giving them over to? What he decreed for them to already be? That's why it doesn't make any sense to say before they did anything good or bad, if you ultimately believe that God is determining the good and the bad they end up being. It doesn't make any rational sense, folks. This is why Calvinism doesn't last. This is why it surges up and then people start thinking again and they go, oh, this doesn't hold water. And they start abandoning it. They jump ship real quickly because this system doesn't hold water. The inconsistencies begin to begin to rise to the surface as people begin to play this stuff out and really begin to read for the first time sometimes. Even though it's been debated throughout history, it surges and dies back out as people become less and less aware of the issues. Now, now notice this. Stott, Leon Morris, leading Calvinistic scholars, God never hardens somebody who has not first hardened himself. And then Piper responds to say, let me say this calmly and firmly. That is exactly the opposite of Romans 9, 18. Okay, what's Piper doing? He's disagreeing with the infralapsarians. He's disagreeing with R.C. Sproul. He's disagreeing with Leon Morris. He's disagreeing with, uh, with uh, John Stott. Do you hear that? Okay, P people think I'm making these controversies up sometimes, or they think I'm not representing Calvinist right. Why do you, why do you think you get, why, why do you think Calvinists number one argument against us is you don't understand Calvinism. You just look back and go, which form of Calvinism are you talking about? Because for every point that they hold to, there is a variety of ways in which it is expounded upon and believed and, and a, a variety of ways in which it is argued. And who does, who does their due diligence to try to show you that on their program's week after week, <laughs> more so than I am. I'm the one showing you there's more kinds of Calvinists out there. Most Calvinists don't even know this that I've come across. Now, there's some, I mean, I'm sure Church and Fan and Chris Harris, some of these guys that are theology geeks like we are, I'm sure they understand some of these things and some of the nuances involved with them. But you guys are rare when it comes to these things. Most Calvinists, the lay-level Calvinists out there, have no idea about the controversies behind the scenes uh, among the super and infralapsarians and these kinds of things where Leon Morris and Stott are, are drawn, uh, uh into contradiction by, by Piper. And you don't, or, or they don't know about MacArthur taking A.W. Pink to task about his view of the love of God and God hating all people and all the, or hating, uh, all the reprobate and all those kinds of things. A lot of people don't know those things. Us theology geeks, we get into it. Okay. And I'm the one who's presenting both sides, 
whereas uh, very few leading Calvinists are doing any kind of, of justice with regard to how they represent us, as already demonstrated earlier by Sproul. And so he says it's opposite of what Leon Morris says. It's the opposite of what John Stott says. It's the opposite of what R.C. Sproul says. And the fifth reason I say so is this. Paul could have so easily removed the objection of verse 19 that way, and he did not. The objector hears Paul say, God hardens whomever he wills, and he responds, Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? How easily Paul could have answered the objection with all the answers of modern man, and he didn't, because they are the wrong answer. They turn his teaching right on its head. He said, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Indeed, he said more, but in a, dir uh, a direction exactly the opposite of what people say today or then expect. Now, yesterday's broadcast, which was a short that was put out by Caleb yesterday, I go through this exact objection and what the objection actually is. So just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over all that again. It's a 15-minute video that I played, put out yesterday about the, the, about, but the, the things that Calvinists hang on to, the, the, the presupposition that Calvinists hang on to with regard to Romans 9. That gets into this exact point, that the objector in the mind of Paul is not a synergist objecting to reprobation. But it is a Jew objecting to the idea of him being cut off to the engrafting of the barbarian Gentiles and him being used in his rebellion, hardened in his rebellion, conditionally hardened in his rebellion, not unconditionally hardened, conditionally hardened in his rebellion, meaning because you've grown callous, because you've become a stick in the mud, because you've become an old wineskin that can't take the new wine, you now have been hardened, you're cut off in your rebellion. God is sending you a spirit of sleeper, speaking to you in parabolic language, keeping you in the dark from recognizing your own Messiah so that you'll cry out, crucify him so as to engraft the Gentiles. That is the objector in the mind of Paul, in my estimation, not a first century synergist objecting to Calvinistic reprobation. It's when, when you see this, it just seems absolutely absurd. You're going, Calvinist, what in the world are you thinking? How in the world do you think that fits in Romans 9, 10, and 11? How he goes on to argue that the same ones who are hardened in chapter 9 are the same ones he says haven't been cut off, uh, uh, haven't stumbled beyond recovery, or, or could be grafted back in. It, they can't be the same people. And that's why you have so much textual gymnastics that have to go on between chapter 9 and chapter 11 to, to wrangle it, to make it all fit, in, in my estimation, for why the Calvinists deal with this. And so look back at this. He says, verse 21 shows that Paul sees mercy and hardening as unconditional because he speaks of objects of mercy and hardening as coming from the same lump of clay. And, and th this, is, this is what's baffling to me is that just because it's coming from the same lump of clay, who is the lump of clay? If the lump of clay is Israel, then this perfectly aligns with what Jeremiah 18 talks about. When he talks about, I have this lump of clay who is Israel, and if some of the clay becomes marred in my hands, he says in Jeremiah 18, and then he says, I have every right as the potter to remold and reshape that, that clay, that now marred lump of clay, into an ignoble purpose. In other words, a purpose used for my good. But the whole question is, did it become marred by design of the potter or did it become marred by the free choice of the clay? And I say the latter is true based upon the evidences of the text itself, which, which the, the, the whole Jeremiah 18 is a warning passage of don't, uh, don't go that direction. If you will repent of this, then I'll reshape and remold you for a noble purpose. Just like he says to, to Timothy, when he says in a house, there are earthenware and if you humble yourself, you cleanse yourself, you will be molded and used for a noble purpose. But if you don't, you'll you'll be used for an ignoble purpose. In other words, the clay has some responsibility as to for what purpose it's going to be used, as seen throughout the text. And so just because he uses the analogy of pottery doesn't mean that the clay has no responsibility for their becoming marred. And Israel, generally speaking, has become marred. Not by the design of the potter. He's not the one making them decisively, causing them to be guilty and hardened. He's reshaping and remolding an already hardened group of people to cry out, crucify him, to use them in their ignoble way, in their sinful, rebellious way, so as to bring a good purpose through them. Now, I could go on forever about this. As you all know, I am a, a long-witted fella. Um, and I was trying to keep this one under an hour. And I look up and it's an hour and 10 minutes already. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure you saw how these things are painted oftentimes within even the Calvinistic framework and how even Calvinists can be at odds with each other. 
And so you get people like the road Calvinist and others online. Leighton, you misrepresented Calvinism because look, R.C. Sproul is an infralapsarian and you paint us all as if we're super lapsarians. And that's actually just false. I've actually demonstrated that through prior videos, ones that I did two years ago, where I show where R.C. Sproul actually comes against the super lapsarians. And I actually show how R.C. Sproul and Leon Morris, John Stott disagree with uh, people like John Piper and others who hold to an unconditional hardening, uh, unconditional reprobation, those kinds of things. And I show how dangerous these views can be, even by your own camp's estimations. And I, why, why, why aren't Calvinists talking about this? That's what I want to know. Why aren't Calvinists out there saying the same things? That's, why wouldn't Sproul, when he was still living, he sat on the stage with Piper. Why didn't he say what he said in his book to John Piper when he was on his stage? That's what I want to know. Why, why are you guys willing to overlook something you write in your books, you author in your books as a rank heresy, and you've got somebody sitting on your stage who holds to that quote-unquote rank heresy, and you don't confront them? And you've got namesakes, both Augustine and Calvin himself, who said these quote-unquote rank heresies, supposedly. That's what I would like to know. I, I, I'm, I'm the only one, seems like, to pointing out these blatant inconsistencies, and I would like to hear Calvinists actually deal with them. Now, let's go over our Super Chats as we close. End of regulation, um, I, I, well, you already, you already uh, I mentioned that one before. Thank you for that. And Steve, I mentioned yours as well. I'm just going back through the uh, Super Chats here. Um, Alien, thanks for your Super Chat. If conversion is not the miracle, but the written means of the gospel, am I wrong in thinking prior to anything the Holy Spirit does inside us, we are able to accept or reject the gospel before conversion? Okay, I have to think through that question um, one step at a time. If conversion is not the miracle, but remember, as I explained, even on Calvinism, conversion is not the miracle, okay? Regeneration precedes conversion. Regeneration precedes the decision to put your trust in Christ. That's what most people mean when they say conversion. That's the turning, the repentance, that I'm turning from my sin and trusting in Christ. That's the conversion. Repent, uh, regeneration precedes that on Calvinism. So regeneration is the miracle on Calvinism. And ironically, it's a miracle on provisionism too. It's just the order of when that miracle happens. Okay. So the, the revelation comes, which comes by means of miracles. I mean, God obviously inspiring the text is a, a miraculous thing. Uh, a lot of things that God does that are supernaturally uh, inspired or brought to us are things that God does. And so the gospel itself is miraculous in the way that it comes to us. It's referred to as the sword of the spirit. Um, it is a, an external weapon that has an internal impact. And so the gospel is the means by which the Holy Spirit impacts us internally on our view. And Alien, there's a lot of articles that I write on that. It's in my book as well. Um, both both my books, uh, but both, well, all three of them mention this in some level or another, but I get into a lot of these uh, different nuances um, in, in a, a lot of videos and, and a lot of places that I would just recommend that you go. So the Holy Spirit, by means of gospel proclamation, by means of the word, impacts us internally. And now if you've shut your ears and your eyes, then those are the means by which the, the sword enters, right? And the, and the word enters. And so if somebody suppresses that word, suppresses the truth, then it's not going to have the internal impact. But that's that's not the truth's fault. That's not a lack of the effectiveness of the teacher. Um, that's not a lack of the desire of the teacher. It's, it's the fault of the student for shutting the, his ears and his eyes to the truth. If you suppress the truth, you'll remain in bondage. If you accept the truth, you'll be set free because truth sets us free. Hopefully that, that helps. Aaron, thank you for your super chat. Would you please lead uh, VSX, VS study through the book of Romans? I'm not sure what VS, oh, verse, ver, verse by verse, I'm guessing what you're saying. It's through the, through the book of Romans. Um, you need to go to Trinity Seminary. <laughs> I, I, th I actually have a course on the book of Romans. And so there are ways to, to take, uh, to take a more of that kind of a study. But yeah, for, it would be a fun Maybe with the, the new broadcast that's going to be coming out, um, stay tuned for that. By the way, you'll be hearing more about the new broadcast that's coming out that goes beyond sociology, in other words, uh, on other topics. And that may be a good one to tackle, is uh, to take a, a, a verse through the book of Romans or something like that and uh, walk through it. Um, we'll, we'll have all kinds of options with that new channel uh, once we get it launched. So y'all be watching for that. But until then, as we always say, go now, share Christ, and show love. God bless.